morning, guys. Uh, so yesterday we introduced the notion of significant figures. Uh, basically, the significant digits are the ones that have meaning. Uh, calculators, unfortunately, whenever you do operations, plus, minus, uh, multiply, divide, it thinks the numbers are exact. It didn't realize that the numbers you're actually using are actually coming from measurements that are limited by the precision of your actual devices. Uh, so we actually came up with some rules here. How do we actually round the answer uh, based on the precision of your equipment? So uh, let's just do a quick practice question here. Uh, first style of question here is just simply asking you how many significant figures when we reported uh, a few different numbers here. So how many f uh, significant figures do these numbers have? 0 0.01020, uh, 3500, and 15.7 times 10 to the negative 2. Right? So you can see if you can go through there. And then just to practice uh, calculation, uh, your rules of sort of uh, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Uh, let's go here. Um, 50.2 times 7.1 divided by 0 0.9000, right? So that's going to be a multiply and divide kind of rule. Uh, for an add and subtract, I'm going to do two of them with you. Uh, one of them is a little bit easier. Uh, let's do 12.50 minus 6.3 add 0 0.864. And then just for you to just start thinking about here, what if I had one that was like 9.8 times 10 to the 3? plus 7 times 10 to the 1 minus 5.00 times 10 to the 2. Right. So again, what you can do is you can just pause the video, try it out for yourself, and see how you do. Uh, when you come back, you can check your answers. So first question, how many significant figures? Remember, we saw digits 1 through 9 are always significant. So I don't need to worry about all these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 9. The problem here is with zeros, sometimes they're important, sometimes they're not important. What we defined is something called the error rule to actually figure out uh, when they're, uh, which ones are not important. And the only rule were if the number has a decimal, uh, you're going to end up shooting to the right. If the number doesn't have a decimal, you can shoot to the left. So imagine standing on the left-hand side here. This number here has a decimal. I'm going to fire at this arrow. The arrow cuts through any number zeros. When it runs into something that's not a zero, it gets stopped. Anything left behind is now going to be significant. Because this arrow here is cut through these zeros, these zeros are what are called placeholders. They just make sure that the 1, 0, 2, 0 are in the correct position, or the correct power of 10. In this case here, this one here would have four sig figs. Uh, this one here, 3, 0, 0, 3, 5, 0, 0, because I don't have a decimal, the arrow cuts through these ones here. This number here has two sig figs. The two digits of meaning, meaning we have one, the three I'm sure about, but the five is actually going to be a guess. I'm actually not sure about that one there. So the guess is always the one that's farthest to the right based on how many significant figures I have. Even though this one isn't quite proper scientific notation, I would just convert it over to proper. Proper scientific notation here should be um, just the first digit between 1 and 9, not like a 15 times 10 to something. But pretty easily here you can still see, well, here's my base numbers. You don't need to do any error rule or anything like that. All base numbers are always important. So this one here is now going to be a 3 fig number. Uh, the next one here, so we're operating, oh no, there's a multiply and a divide together. Fortunately for us, they do the same rule. So all that I would do here is I would just punch it in, 50.2 times 7.1 divided by 0.9. Make sure I get the full numerical answer correct. So the calculator spits out here, 396.0222 repeated. We don't like leaving things as repeated or as fractionals because uh, they look exact. What we're going to do is we're going to say these ones here were probably measurements, so my final answer will be limited by whichever one of these is the least precise. So if you track your way through how many significant figures, 50.2 has three sig figs, 7.1 has two sig figs. Probably the only one that's hard is the 0 0.9000. The arrow cuts this way, so it has four sig figs. The least precise one is actually two sig figs. So what if I needed to take this number and only keep two digits? So we left to right. I'm only allowed to keep the hundreds and this tens position here. This number here is bigger than 5, so I want to write the number as actually 400, but I want to show it as sure, sort of uncertain guessed at the tens position. Without the decimal place, this is a one sig number. I'm actually guessing at the hundreds like we saw yesterday. Remember we saw from our solution yesterday, I can actually write 4.0 times 10 to the 2. Let's double check that numerically we are still 400. Great, 4 times 10 to the 2 is 400. And then because all base numbers are important, this is now ensure the position right beside the 4. So 410, 420, even 390, 380, it's fine. It's up or down, uh, I guess, at the tens position there. So remember, when you do this error rule, it's nice and convenient. It cuts through all the zeros that are unimportant. 
but when you type into the calculator, it still needs to be typed in, divide 0.9. Uh, the arrow just cuts through which zeros are placeholders. Uh, they're not um, important in that sense. So. Uh, let's go through our add and subtract rule. Uh, the third question here is more of a standard question. What I like trying to do here with the add and subtract is you just line up the decimal place. So let's take this 12.50. I want to minus off a 6.3. Usually you do that part first. Then I'm going to add a 0 0.864. Again, normally you don't show it uh, in that fashion. Uh, but your calculator can understand it, no problem. Type the whole thing in your calculator. 12.5 minus 6.3, add 0 .8 864. Calculator gives out 7.064, right? But the calculator doesn't know significant figures. It didn't know these were not exact numbers. It didn't know these ones here were actually, there were some guessed, uh, there's some limited precision. So in this case here, we round to the least decimal place. We basically find where are the guesses in these numbers. Whichever one is the worst guess, I'm gonna round to that spot and I'm not gonna keep anything afterwards. So this first one here is a two decimal place number. This one is a one decimal place number. This one is a three decimal place number. Well, this first decimal place, if that were a 6.4 or 6.5, that would have knocked on my first decimal place. There really is no reason to keep anything afterwards. And again, the 6 is bigger than 5, so I'm going to round that to 7.1. And there we go. We take the answer fully exact coming out of the calculator, but I need to represent it with the correct precision. And this one here has the least uh, significant, uh, least decimal place, 7.1. I wanted just to show you that plus and minus rule one more time in question number four here. The reason why this one is a little bit more challenging, now don't be confused, yes, in some sense it is a sort of this number first gets multiplied, oh I need to do the multiply rule. This is actually writing for you a couple numbers in scientific notation, so you can treat those as together. The main operators we're actually looking at are the plus and the minus. So we still are doing round to the least decimal place as a rule. One way of doing it is sort of brute forcing it. Because I'm not really sure where the decimal places are for all these numbers, I can convert everything to standard form. I can write 9.8 uh, 9 times 1,000 is 9800. Just be careful when you do it, you always represent the right precision. So in this case here, this one would have been a 2 c fig number, even though numerically we are 9800. We want to make sure it's 2 c figs, perfect, 2 c figs. Now we have a 7 times 10 to the 1. I want to add that. 7 times 10 to the 1 is 70. Earlier it has 1 sig fig. Good. In standard form, it still has one sig fig there. Uh, now I have the number 5 times 10 to the 2 again. So 5 times 10 to the 2 would actually be the number 500. This time I'm trying to minus that, right? So that's that position. Again, here's a, what I just mentioned here. Although you're right, the numerical value is 500. That's correct. If I wrote it as 500 zero zero like this, suddenly it looks like a one sig fig number. And yet this number here was supposed to be a three sig fig number. So what I would want to do is I want to just put a decimal there. In fact, even better yet, let's just put a circle around where I'm guessing it. Just reassure yourself I'm actually guessing at the ones position. It's not just 500. It's not guessing suddenly 400, 600, something like that. It's still guessing 501, 502. The uncertainty is there. It might do you good just sort of circling where the guesses are. So perfectly fine. Uh, you can just punch this in your calculator. First, you add the 70 and then you minus uh, 500. Uh, so this gives me here 9370 calculator could give you that as well. And this is just your plain old add and subtract rule. Which one is the worst guess? Because these numbers here are way bigger than the decimal places, don't just find zero decimal, zero decimal, finance, zero decimal. You just look at, well, this one is unsure at the hundreds, this one is unsure at the tens, this one is unsure at the ones. Because this first one here is unsure at the hundreds, if this hundreds were off, if that were actually 9900 or 9700, that would knock off this position and there's no reason to keep anything afterwards. So I would therefore round this to 9,400, right? So that's sort of what I would say the brute force method, right? Especially if these powers got to be any bigger, if they were like 10 to the 50, 10 to the negative 32, something like that, I don't want to be the one to actually count, oh yeah, move the decimal place over, 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 zero point zero. Is there another way to effectively line up the decimal places without actually writing it all out? So I'm just going to demonstrate this for you here. What we're going to do to line up the decimal place, this is what we essentially want to do. We want to make sure the decimals are all in the same position so I can operate on the digits in the right power of 10. How I'm going to do is I'm actually going to play around with the scientific notation. These are all correct scientific notation because the first digit is between 1 and 9. I'm going to slowly switch it out from the regular scientific notation. And what I mean here is I'm actually going to line up the decimal place here. You can line it up by actually lining up the power of 10. And it really doesn't matter which one you line it up to. You can make all of them 10 to the 3, all of them 10 to the 2, or 10 to the 1, uh, but just they have to be in the same power. 
just for argument's sake here, let's say let's make everything into 10 to the 3. So this 7 times 10 to the 1 would have been a number 70. Correct scientific notation is just 10 to the 1. What would this number look like if I rewrote that number? So I'm going to just copy down here. 9.8 times 10 to the 3. What if I rewrote this number as something times 10 to the 3? So it's in the same power of 10 as the first number. Well, if it's moved over 10 to the power of 3, that means that it's actually 1, 2, 3. So that means it actually has to be 0 0.07 times 10 to the 3. Do a double check for yourself here. If you take 0 0.07, you multiply by 1,000, you move the decimal place over. Yep, we get numerically still 70. I know it's not proper scientific notation anymore because we're not quite uh, first digit being 1 to 9. But that's going to be better for us because the power of 10 is now lined up. Let's practice the other one here a little bit closer because it's 5 times 10 to the 2. Well, what if I rewrote that number as actually a times 10 to the 3 number? Well, that means I need to move the decimal place to the left here. That actually is 0 0.5 times 10 to the 3. At least now we have everything lined up in the power 3. And now effectively what we're going to do is we're going to factor off the 10 and 3. We're going to do the plus and minus like we do normally. And then we're going to put the 10 to 3 back. But again, just like we did earlier, no matter you put it back in, this guy here is called standard form when you're not in exponential form or scientific notation it's called standard form, you want to make sure when you rewrite it, it still represents the precision on how it gave it to you. So this number here was 3 sig figs. This 0 0.5, even though I know all base numbers are important, it looks suddenly like only a 1 sig fig number. I'm just going to leave in the 0 and the 0 just to remind myself that was actually 3 sig figs. That's important. So now effectively, because the 10 and the 3s are all in the same power, I'm going to pull the 10 and the 3 to the side, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to operate on the numbers. Now I have a 9.8. They want you to add a 0 0.07. I'm going to minus off a 0 0.500. I can do the sort of decimal place rule for this part. And then just remember at the end of the day, it's all at the power uh, 1,000. So when you crunch through those numbers there, you should get 9.370. Let's do our add and subtract rule. This one was guessed at the 8. This one was guessed at the 7. This was guessed at the 0. This 8 here is the worst guess. If this guess here were off, there's no reason to keep anything afterwards. Let's make it 9.4. But remember, you've lined up the decimal. This was all at the position 10 to the 3. And there we go. We've been able to do the atoms to track rule by lining up uh, the powers of 10. So I'm just going to make that note here. Especially when these numbers get to be really big, uh, we can line up decimals by uh, making all powers of 10 equal. Right. And there was nothing special about 10 to the 3. You could have made all of them 10 to the 2, all of them 10 to the 1, all the power to you. Right. So make sure you're practicing. Luckily for us, a lot of our conversions are purely either plus or minus or purely multiply and divide. The rules were different for those operations. I just want to hint at what if we had to do a mixed calculation? What if in part of our problem, there was a little bit that was a plus and minus, and then you need to multiply, and then you plus and minus again here. The question is, how do you deal with the mixed calculation? What we're going to do in general, especially in a mixed calculation, I'm expecting there to be multiple steps. I want you to keep all the numbers through your calculation. So essentially what that means here is don't round until the really, really end. Most of your calculators here have an answer button. No, it doesn't give you the answer to every question. But what the answer button does is it recalls the number that you just typed in, even if it was repeating and all the decimals unrounded. It takes that complete number through the rest of it. Even though we're not going to round throughout, we are going to have to keep track of our sig fig rules. Keep all numbers through calculation, but watch sig fig rules. And let me just demonstrate for you uh, one of these for practice. Uh, let's take the number here. Let's go uh, 56.0. Let's divide it by 0 0.35. So there's a division. And then let's say there's an add. Uh, let's add it to um, 2.4. Multiply it by uh, 50. All right? So slightly different from the earlier question here. Because there's part multiply divide, part plus, I need to be careful which part uh, follows which rule. First thing I would do is I would just note, well, no matter how weird my rounding gets here, the numerical value shouldn't change. So punch the whole thing into your calculator. Let's go 56 divided by 0.35. Let's add 2.4 times 50. The calculator gives you the number here, 280. 
no matter how weird my rounding gets, the rules get in the middle, my number at the end should still be 280. Now I'm ready to sort of um, uh, have a look uh, at each part separately. I can't just look at this in general and be like, well, this one here, three sig figs, two sig figs, uh, two sig figs, one sig Oh, there's a one sig fig. I can't just suddenly say one sig fig here because that rule is just applying to multiply and divide. That may not apply through this plus here. So through each part, you need to be careful. So let's just punch in this uh, first one here. What is 56 divided by 0.35? This gives you the number here, 160. That was through the operation divide. Divide is this least significant figure rule here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, a three sig fig number divided by a two sig fig number here. So this one here should behave like a two sig fig number, which it is. Now, this number here had been 162, 163. I'm still going to write the entire number unrounded, but I'm going to circle where I'm guessing it. I'm actually guessing at that six there. Let's try the other number here, 2.4 times it by 50. This gives you the number here, 120. I'm going to keep that number here unrounded. Because we are punching through a multiply, I want to round the answer to the least significant figures. The least precise one was a one sig fig number. I want to round this one here to a one sig fig number. So one sig fig number here means I only get to keep one digit. I read left to right. I'm only allowed to keep the hundreds position. If this were the end of the problem, I could have went 120. Well, I want to round it to the 100s position. Let's just make it 100. But because I know I'm going to be punching it through a plus later on, I don't want to accidentally pre-round this 20 before I do the add. So here's what you see. As we track to the last part here, I am going to take the 160. It was unsure at the tens position. I'm going to take the 120. That was unsure at the hundreds position. By adding them together, we numerically get 280, as we would expect normally. But even though I had expected this to be a one sig fig number, I didn't suddenly change it to 100 and didn't suddenly make it 260. I'm still getting the numerical value of 280. It's just that I need to follow my add rule at the really end here. So based on my add rule, which of these guesses is worse? The one that's off in the hundreds position or the six that's off in the tens position? Well, if this one were really 220 or 320, something like that, that would knock off this hundreds position there would be no reason to keep anything afterwards. This is a number bigger than five, so I'm going to round this number to actually 300. All right. So I will just want to show you in that uh, problem here, you'll notice that I didn't do any pre-rounding. I didn't actually take this 120 and make it 100 before I did the plus. I kept the number through it, but I did keep track of my sig figs and watch my sig fig rules here. This one here should only behave like a one sig fig number, so I circled that sig fig. Uh, sometimes uh, you can actually show your work here. Let's say 160. You can actually go 160, make the zero a little bit tinier. The number is still 160, but it's only precise until this big number here. Same as the 120. Maybe I have a 120 like that. That's actually going to add to give uh, 280 like normal. But based on either you circle it or based on the big number, well, this one behaves like a, it's off at the tens. This one behaves like it's off at the hundreds, even though it looks like a specific number. I'm going to want to round it to that position there, making it uh, 300. Again, fortunately for us, we don't have to deal with mixed calculation all that much. It's just harder because the rules are different, whether we multiply, divide, or whether we add and subtract. If you look back at unit conversions, most of them have been, oh, let's multiply this fraction, let's multiply this fraction. It's all the multiply and divide rule. So as long as the very final answer has the precision of the least significant one, uh, we should be fine. All right, so again, your worksheet will have a few uh, practice questions there. Uh, to finish off our lesson, uh, I just want to switch over to take a look at error. Now, error is something different from the sort of uncertainty, the significant figure stuff that we did from earlier. Error actually introduces the notion, when we actually go and make an experiment, when we actually do a measurement here, there's always a whole host of problems that might come into play. What the error actually is, error is actually the difference between your experimental measurement and what's called the true value or in some cases if you don't have a true value it's the accepted value right. so error is the difference it's how far away is your measurement is your reading from the actual reading how far is it supposed to be here's where we actually enter our two older terms we're going to have our term accuracy and precision show up again Remember, these two terms here were very closely related, but they actually are different concepts. If you are accurate, what you want is you want your reading to be close, or your closeness, to the true value. You want to be right. 
So kind of the language here, uh, you want to be right, you want your readings to be valid. So when you went to make this measurement here, you actually came back with a number that you were supposed to find. So for example, let's do a simple um, analogy. Let's say we have 29 students in the classroom. That's the true value, right? If I ask someone, if they tell me 29, they would be accurate. If they tell me 36, they're not accurate. So let's say someone just walks by the hall. They didn't really take a quick count. I just asked them briefly, hey, how many people are in the classroom? And they say to me here, 20. Right? Again, this is not very accurate. The true number, the accepted number is 29, but they said 20. I ask another person who passes by. Again, they don't really have time. They say 21. Right? Also not accurate. Also far off the mark. And yet when I ask a couple people or even the same person I asked a couple times, maybe they kept guessing 20s, 21, 21. In that sense, they're all off. They're all inaccurate. However, what they have in that case there is they actually have some precision. Precision is actually de um, described as the closeness between repeated trials. So that whole language of trials means in science, we usually want to repeat our experiment. We don't want it just by fluke to have gotten what we wanted. We want our things to be reproducible. Again, we won't, don't want it to be by chance that you lucked out. Uh, we want it to be sort of reliable. We want it to be predictable. So if I ask another person, seeing as you got 20s and 21s, if I ask another person, my guess is they're going to say 20 or 21. It builds my confidence that uh, they're doing, uh, they're counting in the same method, even though in this case here, they're actually off the real mark. So having repeat trials. Uh, let's use the sort of bullseye analogy here. So let's throw a couple of darts here. What would I need to throw darts if I am really, really accurate? So the really accurate here in a darts game, I try to hit the bullseye. The bullseye in this case here is 29 students. If they say 29, they are really, really accurate. In this case here, if they just threw one dart, I don't quite have the repeated trials yet. They only checked it once. I don't know if they are a really good dart player and they, they consistently hit uh, the center. I don't know if it's by fluke or not. If I want the precision, I have to ask the person at least twice, at least three times, throw the dart again. And if really they're saying 29, 29, 28, 30, right? If they are getting so close to the mark reliably here, that means here they actually have high precision. Precision just relates to the darts are all landing consistently around the same area. Could it possibly be, let's do another dartboard here. Could it possibly be I have low accuracy? What would I have for low accuracy? Well, I was supposed to hit the bullseye, and I said 20 students when the real value was 29. But just because I'm off, maybe I still have high precision. That's actually the worst case in science here. You're going through, you're, you're trying to make some readings here. You say the first time 20. You throw another dart. You want it to be reproducible. You get 21, 21, 20, 19, 20, 20. You are getting a lot of consistency, a lot of reliability. It's not by chance that you're landing on this side of the board. But maybe the problem is, oh, you're just, you're totally miscounting. You're totally missing one whole side of the room. That's why you're always counting something less. But there we go. It's consistent. It's building your confidence that it wasn't by fluke. But the problem here is we were actually off because of errors. Uh, let's do the other two cases here. What would it look like if we actually have low accuracy? Um, um, sorry, let's do high accuracy. High accuracy but low precision. Right? That usually entails here, well, we were supposed to say 29 students. At least one of my darts here lands on the bullseye. Right? In fact, it's sort of just a breakdown of this analogy here. Your low precision means you're just sort of randomly by chance, maybe you're blindfolded and you're just tossing the dart every which way. Some darts are landing here and here and here and here, right? And usually, because I took this reading multiple times, I usually take an average of these ones here. So let's take a reading. I wanted the number to be 29. Maybe I got a reading. Somebody said 20, somebody said uh, 40, somebody said uh, 25 and 34. You'll notice we're way off the mark. And you'll notice that I don't actually have any dart that's actually landed on the bullseye. However, because all of these were measuring the same quantity, because I have such a wide spread, what I would usually do is I would take an average. If you took those numbers, and if I did that properly here, your average should lie something really close to 29. You'll notice that your average is actually close to the real number. That gives you the high accuracy. We ended up getting the correct number of students. However, because you landed all over the dartboard, if I ask this person again, throw another dart, I have really low confidence in where it's going to land. 
obviously the last artboard here, if I have low accuracy and low precision, even with this whole notion of averaging here, you're hitting all over the mark. And even if you didn't average, if you sort of got a center point here, that center point here is nowhere close to the total mark it's going to be. Right? So accuracy and precision are two different concepts. Obviously in science, we want to be both accurate. We want to be close to the true value we're supposed to get. And we also want to have precision. If I throw a couple darts, I want it to be reliably, consistently giving you that same reading uh, so that it builds my confidence that my technique is good. Now we can cheat a little bit here, even in our uh, sig fake lesson here, we started talking about which number is more precise, which ruler was a better ruler here. In fact, in all those experiments, I just took one reading, it sort of goes against this definition for precision, you have to at least have thrown the dart twice. I want to know whether it's by fluke or by chance whether you're actually getting this number. We're just going to borrow that language of precision, however, this is just a small little cheat. Uh, precision on a single value. If I only took the reading once, if I only asked a person how many kids are in the classroom just once, uh, the precision is actually given by having more decimal places. Precision on a single value is given by the number that has more decimal places, and in some cases we can say having more significant figures. Right. So let's say I do an experiment, let's say you stand on the scale, scale number A, you weigh 50 kilograms. Scale number B, you weigh 51.98 kilograms. Now truth be told, you only stood on the scale once. It's like throwing the dart once. However, even though I don't have reproducibility, I didn't step on the scale multiple times, see if it's by fluke it's giving me these numbers, I would argue that scale B is actually more precise. Because if you're thinking sort of certain digits and guesses, this one, the one and only number that I have is a guess. Maybe I'm 60 kilograms, 40 kilograms, really low precision. Whereas 51.98, not only can I tell you it's a four six three number, that means I'm sure of the tens, I'm sure of the ones, sure of the first decimal place, and I'm actually guessing the second decimal place. I would still argue that this one here is more precise, even though they've only stepped on the scale just once. Right? Uh, sometimes significant figures actually gets it wrong. So let's say, so this number here has four significant figures. Let's say scale number C. Uh, let's say it actually reads, let's say I was weighing something else, 0 0.000002 uh, kilograms. Now you would say, well, this number here, 51.98, has four signature figures. This number only has one signature figure. It's low precision. However, in this case here, I would argue, because our whole goal is to actually try to find more and more decimal places, this one here, it, even though it is just a one significant number, it's actually being able to give you a reading that's really, really far into the uh, decimal places here. I might argue that this one here with one sig fig, even though that one here might be a guess, we might be 03, 04, 05, or whatever, but that one there is still guessing way beyond what the 51.98 is guessing. So I can still argue this one here might actually be more precise, which is why sometimes significant figures gets it wrong. In fact, the most decimal places should be um, the one that's most precise. Lastly for today, I just want to introduce to you why are there reasons that we may be inaccurate? Why may it be between one dart throw and another dart throw here, we're actually having very low precision? We're actually just going to qualify these as two main types of errors. Uh, these two terms are very common in uh, chemistry and biology as well. Uh, you just want to make sure you know these two terms here, good terms that to include in your lab reports. First type of error is called a random error. As the name suggests, a random error is random. It just jumps around, it just skips around here. This random error here has an equal chance of being higher or lower. So it just sort of uh, fluctuates around, it just jumps around. And the reason for this one here is due to fluctuations. Fluctuation is a fancy word for just dancing, jumping around. Fluctuations in your device or fluctuations in your interpretation. So it's either your apparatus, it's either your um, measuring tools are off, or it's how we're reading it uh, that's off. So for example, let's take a, a chemistry analogy here. Let's take a grass cylinder, really bad grass cylinder, it only has a 10 mark. Again, we fill it with a little bit of water, we read the bottom of the meniscus, right? And I ask a few people around the room and they say, okay, I think there's three mils inside, four mils, two mils, two mils, three mils, right? 
I would look at this and say, wait, we're looking at the same device, right? Why are we not getting the same number, right? It's not like the water is actually going up, going down. It's just because this device here isn't really well marked, right? So it's really hard to actually get a well-defined number for it. Um, so that's why this number is just sometimes jumping high, sometimes jumping low. It's equal chance of being up or down. Uh, I've already sort of alluded to it here. How can you sort of minimize these random effects? There's always going to be problems with how good you are as an experimenter. Some people overestimate, some people underestimate. If I actually ask this person more times, I'm actually getting a little more consistency. Looks like you guys are hitting close to three. So maybe I'll say three. And then for a random error, because it's both higher and lower, I'm going to use that plus or minus symbol again. And I can actually say maybe the volume inside is actually three plus or minus one. I'm guessing it's three, but you might be as wrong as three plus one. You might be as wrong as four, that covers that one. You might be as low as three minus one, which is a two. Um, we usually throw around a number like 95%, 97%. This error bar, as we say here, this error bar, that can be plotted on the graph, by the way. This error bar sort of represents my confidence interval. That's another name for it. It sort of tells me how believable this number is. I am still thinking it's three, but given some of the variation that I've gotten here, it may fluctuate, it may dance around either side of it. And this is just a limitation. My device wasn't really nicely marked, and it's based on my interpretation here. It's based on how well I gauge it. Big thing here, you'll know it's a uh, random error. Because it has this equal chance of being uh, higher or lower, we can actually minimize this with repeat trials. Let's do that same experiment more times. Let's repeat that experiment more times. Let's go ask more people. As I ask more people, they might say, three, 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 four, two, three, three, two, two, four, three, right? I'm not surprised that we're not all hitting the same number. But as I ask more people, I'm getting more confident here. For some of the people that tended to overestimate, those sort of have less impact because now a lot more people have gotten threes. It's sort of building my confidence that we are about a three. Still a low sig fig number, right? This three, right? One sig fig. So it could be a four, it could be a five, right? Two uncertain at the ones position. But at least it builds my confidence with doing repeat trials. Let's couple this here with the second type of error. And we'll end off with this. The second type of error is called the systematic error. Careful of how you uh, spell that there. Sometimes I get a, um, a systemic error. It's not something that's sort of, it's a common problem. It's a, a, something that plagues you kind of all over. But in this case here, systematic error means it's something wrong with the design. And these ones here, different from random error, these ones here are usually deviations in only one direction. Either all my values are too big or all my values are too small. Usually this is predetermined usually predetermined, it's fixed by the device. I'm gonna call it the apparatus just so that you're getting used to the language here. Apparatus is my measuring tool, uh, apparatus or your procedure. So let's say uh, the manufacturer came back to you. Uh, they say, really sorry, I know you've been basing your measurements based on this being 10. I meant to say this is actually 100. Right? You'd never order from this manufacturer again. But in that case there, if they tell me it's 100, where I was guessing numbers like three and four and two, I really should have been guessing 30s and 20s and 40s. All my values are all too tiny just because the manufacturer are off, right? It skews everything in one direction that's predetermined by an inaccurately marked apparatus or something wrong with your procedure, especially with this meniscus. I know I was supposed to read the bottom, but what if I forgot that? And what if I've been reading the top? In that case there, every time I've been estimating the top of the meniscus, I'm always gonna get a value that's all too high my numbers would be a little bit higher than what they should be. So for this one here, because there are systematic problems or problems with your procedure, we cannot minimize with repeat trials. If the manufacturer didn't come back to me and tell you, oh, that marking was actually off, I would have no clue. But the only way to sort of address this, depending on what the problem is, but you need to uh, redesign the experiment. Maybe it's as simple as grabbing a grad cylinder that actually marked correctly, uh, maybe it's, um, so for example, uh, just reminding yourself, uh, let's read the bottom of the meniscus. For your scales, you need to calibrate them. Let's make sure to zero, the calibrate the scales, make sure they're uh, sort of matched up to begin with so that when I make a later measurement, it actually is lined up correctly. This one here cannot be minimized with repeat trials. And in every single uh, experiment, there are always going to be random sources and systematic sources here. Uh, 
see if you can identify some specific examples for the procedure that you do. Where are some places that might dance around just randomly? Let's say you have a like an electronic balance and it just jumps around, fluctuates a little bit, or systematic error, something like whoops, I forgot to subtract the mass of the beaker, something something more um, fundamental that wouldn't be fixed with uh, repeat trust. Right. So that finishes off our toolbox section. Uh, in tomorrow's lesson, we're going to switch over to our first big chapter, which is kinematics, which is the study of motion. Thanks, guys.